love Pastor Patrick. I promise I wasn't telling him to keep. <laughs> you know, some preachers, they'll just stall you out. Have the service go three, four hours. But no, the, the presence of God is here. Yeah. The presence of God is here. And even, even during, during that time, I, I, I was saying to myself, Lord, move however you want to move. Right? Because we, we, we are believing for revival here in this house. And revival does not, it, 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 it doesn't come out of the air. Revival starts here. Revival starts on the inside of us. And so it, it only takes a couple of us getting together and surrendering our, ourselves and a time to the move of God in a, in, a, in, a, in a supernatural way. And we have to be okay with the unusual. Amen. To allow God to be able to move. And so always give, give, give way to the set man and how God is speaking to him. Amen. Amen. So I'm excited about our time. I don't know how long I'll be uh, before you. I was told I got 12 minutes because he took all my time. It's 8 o'clock now. But um, God is good. I, 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 I won't be before you long. I have one main thought I want to share, but I need to lay a foundation for us to get there. Amen. It is Wednesday night, and so we may read uh, an unusual amount of scripture, but um, the, the, the believer should be synonymous with the word, right? Amen. And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 13. We'll read through 21. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God is good. When Jesus heard it, I'll give context later into what he heard, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. When Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, do, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit on the grass. And he took the five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. I want to share a little bit from the thought tonight. It's not too late. It's not too late. Father God, we thank you right now, God, for your presence already being here. Lord, we thank you, Father, for meeting us in a supernatural way. God, speak to your word, God, some truth to build us up so we can continue to do the work for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say it's not too late. One of the most essential resources that we as believers have access to once we come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ is wisdom. One of the ways we acquire wisdom, or a few ways we acquire wisdom, is one through study. Studying the Word of God. As believers, we should be digesting the Scriptures on a daily basis. So we'll study the Word of God. You may get a, a, a study guide or even a commentary to help you to understand the scripture and to grow in your wisdom. Another way is just through experience, and that is through the word being tested. And so you can live a certain amount of time. And if, I think, if I'm getting feedback, just give me a handheld and we'll be fine. Um, you'll live a certain amount of time in your life, and you can study the word of God, and you grow in your walk, and through that experience, you gain wisdom. 
Another way that we grow in wisdom with God is through the wisdom that God has already bestowed upon us. And sometimes that can be a problem because you'll know that the children of Israel at one point became wise in their own eyes. And they decided that they needed a king, they wanted a king, that God had no plans to give them a king, but they asked for a king because they became wise in their own eyes and God placed Saul in front of the children of Israel. One of the things that we must realize and and actually believe at some point in our life is that God himself is full wisdom and full intelligence himself. You cannot go outside of God and gain any knowledge or any wisdom anywhere. My wife, she used to have this this app on her on her on her iPad and she would she would do interior decoration on certain homes. It's like this app that she would create rooms and she would bring it to me and be like, what do you think of this? And I'd say, okay, I think you could change this or change that. This may look okay. Half the time she didn't like my ideas anyway. But she would still bring it to me and say, what do you think of this? But as I was looking at it one day, I realized it don't matter what, what, how I redirect or d- uh, direct or, or decorate this room. When God gives you an idea or when God speaks a certain word or gives you wisdom concerning a matter, there's nothing you can do to make that thing better. There's nothing you can think of that is going to make the situation more than what it is once God already speaks because God is full wisdom and full intelligence. Let's read some scripture on tonight. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Proverbs 2 verse 1 through 6 says, My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord. And you will gain knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Somebody say, God, give me wisdom. Proverbs 3, verse 13 through 19 says, Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. For wisdom is more profitable than silver. Her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you can desire compares with her. She offers you long life in her right hand, and riches and honor in her left. She will guide you down delightful paths. All her ways are satisfying. Wisdom, somebody say wisdom, is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold her tightly. By wisdom, the Lord founded the earth. By understanding, he created the heavens. Somebody say, God, give me wisdom. We move to the New Testament in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 10. The scripture here is is referring to Joseph, and it says, And God gave him favor before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God also gave Joseph unusual wisdom, so that Pharaoh appointed him governor over all of Egypt and put him in charge of the palace. Someone say, God, give me wisdom. We move further in the same chapter, verse 22, it says, Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in both speech and action. Say it again. Someone say, God, give me wisdom. God speaks to Moses, and he says, then the Lord said to Moses, look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of Ur, Of the tribe of Judah, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with silver, gold, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and engraving wood. He is a master at every craft. Someone say, God, 
Give me wisdom. In Deuteronomy 34, verse 9, the scripture says, Now Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him, so the people of Israel obeyed him, doing just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Someone say, God, give me wisdom. In our classic pastor of scripture in the Old Testament, we know of King Solomon. And when Solomon came to take the throne, he realized that he had no experience. He realized, he said even to himself, I feel like I'm a child. And he goes to God and he asks for wisdom and understanding. We see in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 10 through 13, the response from God. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you that you have asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart so that no one else so that, that no one else ever have or ever will. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. Someone say, God, give me wisdom. We cross over to the New Testament in James chapter 1, verse 5. James writes, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who will give liberally or give freely without reproach and will be given unto him. I don't know about you. But I want the wisdom of God in my life. In every situation I step into, I want supernatural, unusual wisdom. I want to be able to walk into a room and know exactly what to say and exactly what to do. I want to be able to walk into a situation and have the wisdom of God to be able to speak to a thing. Solomon was so wise, he was brought a situation. There were two harlots and they had babies. One of the babies died and the one baby who died, she stole the other baby. Maybe they come before Solomon, and Solomon had special wisdom to be able to determine whose child it actually was. And so he says, we're going to cut this baby in half. And the mother's who child, the, the, the woman whose child it was, she said, no, 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 just give the baby to the other woman because she wanted the baby to live. That woman would not allow her child to be killed. And Solomon at that point realized whose child it actually was. There is wisdom that God wants to give us to speak into the government. There is wisdom that God wants to give us to speak into our jobs. There's wisdom that God wants to give us to speak into our community. There's wisdom that God wants to give Give us to speak into our families. Some of us have our families have been dealing with generational curses and trials and issues and strongholds and things that have had our family bound for years. And God wants to give us a word of wisdom to be able to speak into that thing and see that thing disintegrated. Somebody say, God, give me wisdom. And so we move here in first. Corinthians, Paul's writing in chapter 1, he says, this foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things that the world considered foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who were powerful. God chose things despised by the, by, by the world, things counted out as nothing at all and use them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Hear this now. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him wisdom itself. There is no other place to go outside of Christ when you need wisdom. I know we can look at the scripture and we can look at the presence of God and the wisdom of God sitting on men and resting on men for situations and circumstances. But when you want wisdom and when you need wisdom, all you've got to do is lean over and have a conversation with your elder brother because Jesus is the answer for your situation. 
Jesus is the answer to your problem because all wisdom was wrapped up in him. The scripture declares that he became our benefit and he is our wisdom. I remember when I had first uh, got a job where I was making a good amount of money. My mom, she came to me. She said, she said that the job offer a 401k. I'm like, yeah, but I didn't go to the meeting because I want my money. And she was like, put, put the money in the 401k. And I put money in the 401k. And, and, and years later, I used that money to actually buy a house. What I didn't realize until I actually took up the company on what they offered was that there was money that was set aside for me. And what we have to understand is that through Jesus Christ, there is wisdom that has been set aside for you and I that you have to tap into. But it's already there. Stop complaining about what you're going through. Stop feeling like you're the only one dealing with the situation that you're going through and realize that there is wisdom that has been set aside for you. Some of us got to say, God, give me wisdom. Paul refers to it as the manifold wisdom of Christ or the multifold wisdom of Christ. means it's, 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 it's unexhaustible. And so regardless of the situation you're in, he'll give you wisdom on how to handle that child. And then it's manifold. So he'll give you wisdom on that relationship. It's manifold. He'll give you wisdom on how to navigate that situation at your job. It's manifold wisdom. It's, 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 it's unexhaustible wisdom. And so there's nothing that you can be dealing with where there is not an answer to it through Jesus Christ. Someone again say God give me wisdom and so Jesus tells his disciples he says look I'm going away the comfort is going to come but look when you get arrested and when you get jailed and when you're brought before those the, 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 the judges don't worry about what you're going to say because the, I will give you the wisdom. You will have the words to say in the moment when you need it. And so when we look at the book of Acts, in Acts, I believe it's chapter 4, when, when, when Peter and John healed the man who was lame, and they get brought before all of the judges, and when they get brought before the officials, you'll notice that the officials said something after they heard them out. They looked at them, and they said, these are some uneducated fools. But the wisdom that they had and the boldness that they had was so strong because they had been connected to Jesus. And I'm telling you right now, forget about your education. Forget about what you feel like you don't have. Forget about what's not in the bank. And if you will step into or tap into the revelation that Jesus is the wisdom that you need in your life, you can stand before anybody and they might look at you and say you got a GED. They might look at you and say you're uneducated, but they will not be able to deny the power of God that is on your life. God, give me wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom for my situation. And so the challenge that we're dealing with, the challenge that we're dealing with is that we grow up. And we become adults. But it's interesting because you read 1 John and everybody's a child. My children, my, 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 my little children, but we grow up and we forget that principle. It's interesting. My kids think I know everything <laughs> because they're a child. But the challenge that we have as adults is that we grow up and we forget that in the eyes of God, you're still a child. Ask him childlike questions. Because that's how he sees you. Another challenge is that we don't apply wisdom. Come on now. We don't apply wisdom. We hear. We, 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 we study. We take a course. But there's no application. So the challenge is, is that I'm grown and don't nobody tell me what to do. And, 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 and I can't receive. But then when I do humble myself a little bit, I don't apply 
the wisdom that's brought to me. And, 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 and these are challenges that we deal with. The challenge of, of, of professing to be wise, the, wise the, 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 the pride that we have and feeling like we know everything, the pride that we have and feeling like we can figure out our situation, the pride that we have that says, I'm, 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 I'm of age now. And I, I have this experience or this is on my resume. The pride that we have when we're not teachable, when God wants to get something to us, if we can just submit ourselves to wisdom. I went through a hard season some years ago, a hard time some years ago. And I had a mentor, a brother, a brother of mine, a friend of mine. He's still in my life. My buddy Ken, my buddy Ken Lindsay, who lives in Greenville, South Carolina. Shout out to Ken's Lindsay, Ken Lindsay. I was going through a hard time. And he said, Nick. There's a pantry you can go to to get food to feed your family. I got I to gotta speak to somebody in here. See, when you're dealing with pride, you can't hear nobody. But, but, but there were some responsibilities that I couldn't take care of on my own. But if I, was, if, if, if I shut my ears off to wisdom. And so I go, I, I go over to this pantry and I pull up there. And the place was closed. But, but I look over to my left, and I see a Caucasian guy sitting in his SUV. And I go and I knock on the window. He rolls the window down. And I'm like, hey, do you know if this place is, is going to be open? He said, he said, I don't know. I just pulled over here to eat my lunch. He was eating some, some Wendy's chili. Or he was eating chili. Wendy's don't tithe here, so forget that. It wasn't Wendy's. He was eating some chili. He was eating some chili. And he said, I, I, I don't know, but hold on for a minute. And so I held on for a minute. And he just finished, he just finished his chili. And he said, hey, it's a grocery store around the corner. If you follow me there, I'll get you some groceries. See, I'm free. I'm okay with this, right? I follow him to the grocery store. And the man says, just go get whatever you want. Take as much time as you want. Fills the whole cart up. I come to the checkout line. This all you want? I filled the whole cart up. He sent me back to get more stuff. Now, mind you, we talking about pride here. I come home, tell my wife what he did. He gave me his number. And I kid you not, he would literally drop stuff off at our home. He would literally bring us money. I knew this man from nowhere. But my ears were not shut to wisdom. And it wasn't long. I had got on my feet and we were really, really, really good. And I tried to find him. I could not find the man. Phone wasn't working. I knew where he worked. He was retiring. I went, I went to his old boss. They didn't know where he was. And like that, he was gone. But it was the wisdom of God. Y'all got to hear me. It was the wisdom of God. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. But if you are walking in pride, you will not hear the voice of the Lord. You will not submit yourself. You will not be able to receive. And you will not be able to go to the next level that God wants to take you to. God, give me wisdom. And so as we, as we look at this passage, I got 10 more minutes. And for context, Scripture says when Jesus heard this, what did he hear? He had just heard his cousin was murdered. And, 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 and before that, 
He had just been rejected by his family. And so the, 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 the man Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, he, he, he's emotional. He's going through. And scripture says that he, he goes off by himself to a deserted place because he, he, he was hurting. And the multitudes follow him. The disciples follow him. And the disciples say, man, we in a deserted place. And they were. How many of y'all have been in a deserted place because you were following Christ? How many times have you been led to a deserted place? And it's a beautiful thing. And I, I love the fact that he was rejected by his family. I, I personally love the fact that he experienced losing a loved one. Because out of that experience with us gives him compassion. And so Jesus went through everything we would have experienced and was found without sin. You got to see that now. But there ain't no wrong, there's nothing wrong with being in the desert when you're with Jesus. And so even with the experience of following Christ and Christ take you to a deserted place, God will make streams in a desert to supply the needs that you need to be supplied. And so they're saying, this is a deserted place. But I wonder how the children of Israel felt when, when, when God said, I'm going to deliver you from the, 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 the Egyptians and they get to the edge of a Red Sea, they had to have felt like they were in a desert place. But how many of you know that God can deliver you no matter where you are as long as you're with him? And so regardless of where you're at today, there is wisdom for your situation. I can only imagine after he had, had split the Red Sea and told him he was going to bring him into the promised land and this new generation is walking with him, they get to Jericho and they find out that it's shut up, no one's getting out and no one's going in and there's walls that are so high, they had to have felt like they were in a deserted place. And some of us feel like we're desolate But God can make a way out of no way. They say we're in a desert. Not just in a desert, but it's late. Been believing for something for a long time and it's late. Been trusting God since January. All of a sudden April rolls around. All of a sudden, June rolls around. Then we move into the fall, and now we're at the end of the year, and you get to, 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 to New Year's, and you're believing for another thing because you, you're trusting God for something else because your faith failed for the last thing, and so maybe I didn't hear God, so let me trust God for something else. And now it's getting later, and it's getting later. Here's the thing we're feeling like your, 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 your season has passed you or that you're late. Have you ever been running late? What happens when you're running late? You start rushing. You end up forgetting stuff on your journey. How many of y'all have been, felt like you were running late, got in your car, got on the highway, and saw a crazy accident and realized, man, that would have been me if I would have left the house when I felt like I needed to leave the house. That would have been me if I would have been attempting to get to my destination when I felt like I needed to be at that destination. That would have been me if the timing would have been my timing. That would have been me if God would have been listening to me while I was whining and crying and complaining and thinking that I was late. But no, 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 no. That was the Lord protecting you. That was God watching out for you. That was God preserving the promise that he had for you. And you're not late. Your season is right now. We're in a desert. It's late. And we got five loaves and two fish. Our resources are running out. 
And I'm coming to a close here because there, there, there's one simple principle I just want to share with you tonight. One simple principle. Because it's not the fact that you're in a desert. It has nothing to do with you being late or you being on time. Or you, my life is in the hands of God. Point blank period. Your life is in the hands of God. Stop looking at the clock and feeling like, man, time has passed me. Or I'm too old. And that season is gone. And it's never going to happen. The devil is alive. Stop looking at your bank account and saying, man, I don't have the resources. I can't make it. It's not going to happen. The devil is alive. Because God gives seed to the sower. As long as you're a good steward and you're sowing in the kingdom, you will reap in due time. Do not grow weary. And so they're complaining. We're in a desert. It's late. And we don't have enough resources. Jesus says, bring them to me. I've been up here for 30 minutes to share this one point with you. Because you're looking at the text. We spent 20 minutes talking about the wisdom of God. But clearly there's a need in this passage. So how in the world did the two connect? It's in the text. Verse 19, he says, bring them to me. Then he says, have them all sit down in the grass. Now, mind you, there were only, there were 5,000 men there. We were in the back, pastor educated me. It was everybody in the region would have been there, so there were probably about 12,000 people there. There's a need but there's chaos. And so Jesus, in his wisdom, he says, sit everybody down. So what's the principle here? The principle is order before increase. And some of us are struggling with stuff. We feel like we're in a desert. We feel like it's late. We feel like we don't have the resources. Jesus says, I ain't worried about that. I need order in your life before I can bless you. And so I just submit to you on tonight That the wisdom that you need for your situation is right at hand. Stop looking at the external. Because that's not the issue. And that wasn't the issue in this passage. That's not the issue in your life. It's a matter of wisdom. And that's what God is calling us to walk in. Order before increase. There's things you can think of in your life right now that you need to bring more order to. Situations, relationships that you need to bring order to. And then the supernatural increase will come. Because our wisdom is found in Christ Jesus. I want to pray for somebody on tonight. I don't even need to know the situation. You and God does. If you know you need wisdom for a situation, raise your hand right now. And I just want you to stand. I'm not going to do no long altar call.
Hallelujah. I'm tired of trying to figure out stuff on my own. There's some things, you know, Pastor, we can't think ourselves out of. It's some situations you in, you can't think yourself out of that situation. You need the wisdom of God. Hands lifted. All over the room, hands lifted. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, I'm, I, I'm, I'm coming to break pride off of some of you on tonight. There's a stubbornness in some of you. The promised land, it, it, it's, it's, it's one step ahead of you. But I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying to some of us in here on tonight that you've got to humble yourself. Some of you in here on tonight just need to go to the person God told you to go to already and just ask for help. So we break that spirit of pride off of you on tonight. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And so, Lord, after we've humbled ourselves, God, we come asking you, Father, for wisdom. Lord, many of us are going through situations, God, strongholds, things that we've been dealing with for years, Father. We can't think our way out of it. We can't strategize our way out of it. We can't talk our way out of it. We can't, we can't plan our way out of it. We need supernatural wisdom. We need unusual wisdom from you, Father. Lord, I ask right now that you will begin to speak to those even on tonight. The wisdom that you have for their situation, God. Then in the next coming days, Father God, they're going to have the answers that they need, Lord. That they're going to apply the wisdom, God, to their lives, Lord. That they're going to see the changes and the shifts, God, the things that you want to do, the resources that you have for them, God. I thank you, Lord, that wisdom is going to be their portion on tonight. That they'll be able to, to walk into rooms and speak to CEOs. That they'll be able to walk in the rooms and declare your word that they'll be able to walk into rooms and change atmospheres, God, because of your presence and the spirit of wisdom that's about to rest on them. Wisdom on how to navigate family relationships with, with exes and, and, and baby mamas and boyfriends and, and, and uncles and aunts and hard things and hard places, God. Things we can't escape. Relationships we just can't get out of, God. I thank you for wisdom, Lord. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in the lives of your people. We thank you, God, for what you're doing here in Karis Church. We thank you, God, for the revival that you're bringing to this house. And, Lord, we thank you that it first starts with us. We bless you, Father. We give you glory on tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give Pastor Nick a hand. Before we close, just a couple things. First of all, Pastor Nick, I just believe that you are specifically and uniquely anointed to declare this message. Not just here, but to the body. There are certain phrases that articulate seasons. And tonight... The Lord used you to drop a phrase in this house. I was with a group of leaders here having a leadership meeting, and I don't know if even anyone even heard it, but I told them, I said, when we first got here, because we're six months into this being pastors here, I said, the first little bit was a honeymoon, 
And then we went into a season of bonding, but now we've stepped into a season of order. And the Lord just spoke right through you. Order before increase. This is a corporate word, but this is also a personal word. Somebody's got to grab onto this. Order. What needs to get in order? Let's get practical. Now we need wisdom. What you're talking about, that was so powerful. What needs to get in order? Ask God for wisdom. What needs to get in order? Because we're praying for the increase. We're praying for Jesus, the multiplier of five loaves and two fish. And he's like, wait a second, order before increase. What needs to get in order in my mind, in my heart, in my body, in my finances, in my life? How do I need to do things differently? I believe this is a great word as we end the year and go into the next year. Somebody say order before increase. Now, while I was, while you were ministering, I wasn't distracted and I wasn't searching on things. I was having a conversation with the mayor. And I told her when we first came here, I said, our assignment is not just the church. Our assignment is not just the city. Our assignment is to you, to pray for you. We're not here for anything. We don't need any recognition. We don't need titles. Been there, done that. Over it. It's not that great. But we're assigned to pray for you. And so she she was writing me in the middle of this. And you were talking about wisdom. And the Lord was giving me wisdom, a word of wisdom to speak to her. But she, she said, ask for prayer. There's a gentleman. There's been people who are attacking, attacking, attacking. And it doesn't matter what your politics are. Because if you really know, if you're in the spirit, we're of a different politic anyway. We're not of this world. Come on, somebody. And so I'm not red and I'm not blue. I'm purple. We are a royal priesthood. Somebody will get that in a minute. But so it doesn't matter. We work with everybody. We love everybody. And... There's just been this attack, 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 attack. And I told her, it's a Nehemiah thing. It's an attack. The Sambalas, the Tobias, they're talking. Come down. And you just got to look at them and say, you know what? The work we're doing is too great. And so we don't have time for that. And so we got we to gotta build with one hand. We got a tool in one hand and a, and a, and a weapon in the other. <laughs> so as I'm ambidextrously building the wall up, I'm cutting you down, these attacks that are coming up against me. But she asked for special prayer because this is a gentleman who's been attacking in the council meetings. And I just told her, I said, this, this foolish stuff has got to stop because it's, it's, it's interrupting the business of the city. And we have to see, Colleen is, and I whispered this in her ear when she came here. I said, the word is, Colleen is a city on the rise. And so everywhere she goes in every meeting, she's, she's making that announcement. This is a city on the rise. This is a city on the rise. We have to speak positive. We have to speak the word of the Lord. We have to prophesy over our city. It's a city on the rise. Brother Lavalas has his hashtag, free my city. God's hand is on this city. And he wants to distract the, the politicians, the leaders with a bunch of foolishness. But we're going to pray right now for her, for protection bunch of vulgar, vile, foolish stuff I saw in the in the Herald. This guy's talking, and the Lord's going to silence this now. And we're going to speak peace into her, vision into her, godly vision into her, and godly concepts and ideas that are going to change the trajectory of this city. Come on now. So right now, we lift up our mayor in Jesus' name. Before we get out of here, we lift up our mayor. Come on, pray for her like she's one of your relatives. Like she's one of your children, one of your family members, a spouse, a, a cousin, somebody. Pray for her right now, Mayor Debbie Nash King. We lift her up right now. Every attack, every vulgar attack, every lie of the enemy that's trying to come against her and the leadership of this city. Right now, we pray for a godly vision for this city. We pray that Colleen is going to be a city of peace. It's going to be a city of revival. It's going to be a model city in this state and in this nation. And so right now, we lift up our mayor and we just pray right now just let that all that junk just settle off of her and give her strength and give her shalom now in Jesus name we pray amen amen amen
God gives us people that we're supposed to talk to. So I'm sitting here trying to, I'm, I'm listening to the sermon, amen, but I'm like, he's talking about wisdom. Go give a word of wisdom right now. And so we just started texting. She just said, thank you so much for the word tonight. And we just told her we're going to pray. So we're praying in service tonight. Amen.